The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lecture on nonlinear finite element analysis of solids and structures. In this lecture, I'd like to continue with our discussion of structural elements. And in particular, I'd like to concentrate our attention now first on the formulation of beam elements. After that, I'd like to talk more about the formulation of shell elements and then show you applications. Uh, when we talk about beam elements, we might think about the usual Hermitian beam elements in which the transverse displacements are cubically interpolated and the longitudinal displacements are linearly interpolated. This is an element that is usually used in linear analysis and very widely used. You might have used it quite a bit yourself. Uh, and it is also very effective in the analysis of linear uh, response of structures. However, in my discussion now, I will talk about the isoparametric beam element and how we formulate the isoparametric beam element, in other words, and how we apply it in the analysis of structures. So when I talk about a beam element, I really mean this isoparametric beam element that we are formulating in this lecture. The isoparametric beam formulation can be very effective for the analysis of curved beams, for the analysis of geometrically nonlinear problems, and for the analysis of stiffened shell structures where we couple the isoparametric beam with the isoparametrically formulated shell elements. The formulation is quite analogous to the formulation of the degenerate shell elements, the isoparametric degenerate shell elements that we discussed in the previous lecture. And so we can go a bit fast over the formulation of the beam element. Here I'm showing a typical beam element, rectangular cross-section. Uh, here we show three nodes. Actually, the beam element can be used with two nodes, three nodes, or four nodes, as we will discuss further later on. We notice that uh, the depth of the element is AK, the thickness of the element is BK, and notice that at these nodes now we measure certain nodal point variables, and here I'm showing the nodal point variables that we do measure at the nodes. Three displacements, incremental displacements, and three incremental rotations. Notice that the description of the beam element follows much the same way, the geometric description of the beam element follows uh, much the same way as we are dealing with the shell element. We introduce director vectors. Now we have two director vectors. In the shell, of course, we had only one director vector per node. Now we have two. Here we show TVSK, the director vector at time t into the s direction corresponding to node k. Notice here TVTK, the director vector at time t corresponding to node k into the t direction. This t means direction t. That t up there means time t. Uh, notice that corresponding to this direction t here, we have the t isoparametric coordinate. And of course, this t isoparametric coordinate uh, also runs into the thickness ak. Notice that corresponding to bk, we have the s direction coordinate. And that s direction coordinate, s isoparametric coordinate, runs into the direction of the director vector TVSK. Uh, so these are the variables used to describe the geometry and the displacements of the uh, beam element. We start with the general equation for the geometry at time t. Here we have Txi, the coordinates of a material part particle within the element at time t. And remember, the, these are the coordinates measured in the stationary coordinate, coordinate system. And these coordinates are obtained as shown on the right-hand side. Let's have a close look at what we see on the right-hand side. We have the HK interpolation function. 
This is the interpolation function corresponding to the R direction running through the nodes of the element along the mid-surface of the element. And it's a one-dimensional interpolation function, the same one that we are used to see for the truss element. These are the nodal point coordinates at time t. We are summing over all the nodal points, k from 1 to n, and n can be equal to 2, 3, or 4, as I mentioned earlier. Then we add to this term a term that comes in because of the thickness of the beam into the t direction. A k, thickness of the beam into the t direction. Here is the t coordinate, the isoparametric coordinate going from minus 1 to plus 1. Here we have h k, same interpolation function as there. And here we have the direction, cosines of the director vector in the t direction at time t. A similar term, similar to this one, is added for the s direction. s, the isoparametric coordinate running from minus 1 to plus 1, bk being the thickness into the s direction at node k, hk, same interpolation function that we have seen up here already, and these are the direction cosines of the director vector into the s direction corresponding to node k at time t. This equation is very similar to the equation that we used in the shelf element formulation. Of course, in the shelf element formulation, we interpolate it here in a two-dimensional domain over the shell mid-surface. Now we only run along the neutral axis of the beam. And we had only one term in the shell corresponding to the director vector. There was only one direction, namely the one normal to the mid-surface of the shell. Here we have now two directions to deal with. Since the displacements can directly be obtained from the geometry interpolation at time t minus the geometry interpolation at time zero, of course this geometry interpolation is obtained by simply substituting in the equation that we just looked at for time t the time zero. Since we obtain TUI as shown here, this is the result. We simply apply our geometry interpolation at time t and at time 0, subtract, this is what you get on the right-hand side. Nodal point displacements from time 0 to time t, measured in the stationary global Cartesian coordinate system. Here, change in the director vector cosines, or I should say, uh, more precisely maybe, the change in the cosines of the director vectors from time, cosines of the angles, director vector time 0, director vector time t. Of course, remember here we have direction cosines corresponding to time t. Here we have direction cosines corresponding to time 0. We subtract, and that goes in here. Here, same kind of term, but for direction s. Also, the incremental displacements are obtained from this relationship here. And if you apply the geometry interpolation at time t plus delta t and at time t, you directly obtain this right-hand side. These are the increments in the direction cosines from time t to time t plus delta t of the director vector in the t direction, similar here for the s direction. Of course, we are used very well to deal with incremental nodal point displacements, but we cannot very well deal with these quantities here, Vti and Vsi. We want to deal with nodal point rotations. And so what we do is we express this quantity and that quantity in terms of nodal point rotations, and that those expressions are given down here. These are the two expressions. You can simply multiply out, and you would immediately see that they indeed hold. With these geometry and displacement interpolations established, we can now directly calculate or establish the strain displacement matrices corresponding to the Cartesian strain components. And then a simple transformation, standard transformation, gives us the strain displacement matrices corresponding to the eta, zeta, xi directions. Of course, uh, these are the components of strains uh, 
uh, or the directions with the components of strains and stresses that we need to deal with for the beam formulation. Notice that uh, zeta here is a physical coordinate running into the uh, direction, so to say, of the A thickness of the beam. And zeta corresponds to the T isoparametric coordinate that we just talked about. Psi here corresponds to the S isoparametric coordinate and runs into the B width, so to say, of the beam. Eta here corresponds to the R isoparametric coordinate. Of course, these zeta, eta, and psi are actual physical coordinates that we are dealing with. We have to, of course, calculate the tau uh, psi uh, eta, the tau eta eta, and the tau zeta psi stress components and corresponding strain components for the beam formulation. And the stress-strain law corresponding to these components is given here. Notice tau eta eta is obtained by taking the Young's modulus and multiplying uh, the Young's modulus by epsilon eta eta, and so on. Notice here we have one shear component and another shear component corresponding to this column and corresponding to that column. And here we have the k factor, the shear correction factor that we are already used uh, to from the shell analysis uh, formulation that we discussed earlier. Uh, notice that via the same approach, we can also directly uh, obtain a beam element for elastoplastic and creep analysis. In this particular case, of course, the only stress components that would be non-zero again would be tau eta eta, tau eta uh, zeta, and tau eta psi. The approach here is very closely, very similar to uh, what we have discussed earlier regarding the shell element formulation. There is one important point in the beam element formulation, namely that with the kinematic assumptions used so far, for the beam element, we do not allow cross-sectional out-of-plane displacements. We do not allow warping. Our interpolation does not contain the effect of warping. In torsional loading, however, we know that warping is very important. And for that reason, we need to amend our displacement assumptions by two more displacement patterns, so to say. Uh, we allow the, these displacements to take place in the element. U eta is equal to alpha times psi zeta. This is the exact warping displacement for infinitely narrow sections. Uh, and this term here, with beta a constant, is the exact warping displacement for a square cross-section. Now, the actual section might not be infinitely narrow, might not be square, but we uh, can easily test, and uh, I will show you just now an example, that in fact the superposition of these functions and the evaluation of alpha and beta by static condensation actually yields good results even for uh, cross-sections that are not infinitely narrow and that are not exactly square. Let's look at an example, linear elasticity. If we take a section and simply put it into torsion with b over a equal to 1, uh, the analytical value given by Timoshenko for this k constant here in that formula is 0.141. And well, we obtain with this formulation exactly that same value. We need to get it because we have embedded the proper interpolation for u eta into our formulation and then use static condensation, of course, to condense out these two constants, alpha and beta, that I just talked about. Uh, for b over a very large, a very narrow section, we also get the exact result in our final element solution, the exact analytical result. In between, we have a small error, an error that, however, we believe is quite acceptable. Let's look at one example that uh, i like to show you the results of. You might be interested in uh, uh, this example. Here we have a narrow ring uh, 
here you have a plan view of that ring with the dimensions given and Young's modulus and Poisson ratio given for that ring subjected to these bending moments. Of course, the twisting capability or capacity of the beam is of utmost importance now. Importance now has to be properly modeled uh, under this loading condition. Uh, the model that we use to analyze the problem is shown here. And you can see at one side of the ring we have fixed it. And at the other side, we prescribe a rotation, theta x. We used here four node elements as shown. This analysis was actually inspired by us looking around in our office and seeing a magnetic tape lying there. And if you look around, you might have yourself a magnetic tape there. And you pick up this little ring from the magnetic tape. And here, I'd like to just demonstrate to you briefly what we are doing. You see here we have this ring, much alike of what I've shown you on the view graph. I'm fixing it on the one side. And on, with my right hand now, these two fingers, I'm going to put on a rotation onto that ring. And I'm going to turn my fingers 180 degrees. So please watch closely. This is what I'm doing. I'm just turning my fingers 180 degrees. And by turning my fingers 180 degrees, if you watch very closely, you can see that the top of the ring does not touch now the bottom of the ring. There is actually a little gap in between of course, because of the elasticity in the ring. So this is what I try to do now on the computer. And what I'm particularly also interested in to see is the amount of moment required in my right hand, so to say, to be transmitted to the ring in order to twist it. Well, here we have the results for the computer solution. Notice here we have a force deflection curve, rotation here, up to 180 degrees, moment plotted here in pounds inch. And you can see that there's a fairly linear behavior first, but then a highly nonlinear behavior as the rotation becomes very large. Here we use the TL formulation for the beam element. And once again, we rotated it 180 degrees as I have shown you uh, with my little experiments there. If you look at the beam, you see a top view like that. And the side view looks this way. I pointed out that top and bottom do not touch each other. There is a little air gap in between. I'd like to show you now another uh, solution regarding the torsion net analysis. And uh, let me walk over to the slides here where I actually have two slides regarding that solution. The interesting part of this problem is that we now, in this particular analysis, are using the same displacement interpolation functions that, for which I've shown you already two analyses in which the material remained elastic. The same interpolation functions are now also used to analyze an elastoplastic problem. And the problem is described here, where we have now a square section subjected to a torque. The material data that Greenberg used are given here. And in our analysis, we used these material data, where the yield stress and the strain hardening modulus are matched to this stress-strain law here. Now notice what is going to happen is we are increasing this torque incrementally. And we want to bring, of course, this section into the elastoplastic regime to see how the section will take the torque. On this slide now, we have plotted the torque vertically and the rotation horizontally, both quantities uh, with some constants attached, as you can see, and the Greenberg result and the Adena results are indeed very close. Please uh, look at the reference that is given in the study guide if you're interested in seeing and reading more about this problem. Let me now walk back to the view graphs and uh, continue with the discussion of uh, the material relating 
to isoparametric beams and shell elements. The next topic that I'd like to uh, talk to you about is the actual use of these elements. Of course, the shell element that I'm here uh, talking about, or that I will share some more experiences with you uh, upon, is the shell element that I have been already discussing in the earlier lecture. So please refer back to that lecture uh, with respect to this discussion. One interesting point is that these elements can all be programmed for use with different numbers of nodes. For the beam, we can have two, three, or four nodes, as already mentioned earlier. And for the shell, we could have four, eight, nine, up to 16 nodes, as I mentioned also in the earlier lecture. The elements with these nodal point configurations can be employed for analysis of moderately thick structures. Remember, shear deformations are approximately taken into account. However, if we think of the analysis of thin structures, then we have to be very careful and only certain elements of the ones that I just referred to should be employed. For shells, we can only recommend to use a 16-node element with 4x4 four four Gauss integration over the mid-surface. This element is depicted here. 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 times gives us 16 nodes and 4x4 four four integration indicated by the blue crosses. For beams, we best use the two-node beam element with one-point integration along the R direction or the three-node beam element with two-point integration along the R direction or with Gauss integration or the four-node beam element with three-point Gauss integration along the R direction. We have to ask, of course, now why is that so? Well, the reason is that the other elements become overly and artificially stiff when we use them to model thin structures, thin and curved structures. Two phenomena occur, shear locking and membrane locking. Most interesting phenomena, and I'd like to share with you now some information regarding these phenomena. The two, three, and four node beam elements with one, two, and three point Gauss integration along the beam axis do not display these phenomena, these shear and membrane locking phenomena. Pro but please notice I'm using one, two, and three point Gauss integration corresponding to the two, three, and four node beam elements. The 16 node element with four by four integration, Gauss integration, uh, is also relatively immune to shear and membrane locking. However, we have to be careful here. The element should not be distorted for best predictive capability. Let us study what this shear locking phenomenon is. And to do so, let us look at a two-noded beam, a very simple beam, in just two-dimensional action. So we have one node here and one node there. And uh, the deformations of the beam are described by W1 and theta1 at this node and W2 and theta2 at this node. Notice the deformations of the beam, of course, are given by W, the transverse displacement, and beta, the section rotation. Uh, the transverse displacement and section rotations, W and beta, are interpolated linearly as shown here via the nodal point displacements and rotations. Notice the linear interpolation, of course, is given here via this expression and that expression, and similarly here via this expression and that expression. Now, there's one important point, namely that W and beta are independent no, independent quantities. The independent quantities, if you are familiar, as you probably are, uh, with Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, you recognize that in Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, they are not independent quantities. In fact, beta is dw dr, or dw dx, x being the physical uh, coordinate. Here, in our formulation, isoparametric, degenerate elements, we have that beta and w, these two quantities, once again, are, linear, are independent, are independent and linear inter linearly interpolated in this particular beam element. Of course, they are tied together. These two quantities are tied together by the physics, 
and that is by the shear deformations. So let's look at that next. Here we have that gamma, the shear strain, is equal to del w del x minus beta. And this is shown here on the picture. Notice this is the neutral axis of the beam, which originally, of course, was horizontal. Here we have a vertical line shown in green. And the section rotation is shown as the angle beta here. These are the material particles shown in red that were originally, of course, at right angles to the neutral axis and that were originally vertically up, lying vertically up. In other words, this line here, this red line was a vertical line originally and was originally at right angles to the neutral axis. That right angle is not preserved because gamma is there and gamma is in general non-zero. This is here, of course, the W dx. So this is picture here shows what we are calculating up here. And you can see that gamma ties together W and beta, which are, however, by themselves interpolated independently. Consider now the simple case of a cantilever subjected to a tip bending moment. And we use one two-node beam element to model the cantilever. Clearly, at this end, the section rotation is zero, and W1, the transverse displacement, is also zero. So these are the boundary conditions at this end of the cantilever. And if we use these boundary conditions and put them into our general equation, we get directly that beta is given as shown here, and gamma is given as shown here. Now look at this equation carefully. We have a constant term and a linear variant term. The exact solution to this problem, analytical solution to this problem, if uh, we use elementary beam theory, we would immediately recognize that the shear strain must be zero for this element or for this beam situation. The shear strain should be zero. Now, if we look at this carefully, we can see that gamma can only be zero if W2 is zero and theta2 is zero. But if theta2 and W2 are zero, rotation and transverse displacement right here at this end, then the beam would have not deflected. And of course, that does not bear out, is not borne out in physics. We know that if we take a beam and put a bending moment on it, then we get a deflection here and a rotation at this end. So you can see already from this equation here that there will be some difficulty. There will be some difficulty because gamma should be zero physically, and this equation tells that gamma can't really be exactly zero. Well, that is once more summarized in this sentence here. Clearly, gamma cannot be zero at all points along the beam unless theta 2 and w2 are both zero but then also beta would be zero and there would be no bending of the beam. Let's look now at this point. Since for the beam, the bending strain energy is proportional to h cubed, elementary beam theory again, the shear strain energy is proportional to h, uh, elementary beam theory, we see immediately that any error in the shear strains due to the finite element interpolation functions becomes increasingly more detrimental as h becomes small. Why is that the case? If h becomes small, then this number becomes very rapidly small. This number here becomes small, but this one goes much faster towards very small, so to say. And if there is an error in the shear strain energy, that error, because of this proportionality sign, is going to be magnified relative to any error that we would see here, and it's going to be detrimental in our solution. Let's look at uh, an example for the cantilever example, this very simple example that we just uh, studied already a bit. The shear strain energy should be zero. And as h decreases, the relative error in the shear strain increases rapidly and in effect introduces an artificial stiffness, which we call, which we identify as locking of the model. 
This is a terminology that is quite widely used now. We say that the model locks. Let's look at some results. In this table, we show the results for h over l, with l equal to 100, for these three values. The analytical value for the rotation at the end where the bending moment is applied is given here, Bernoulli beam theory. The finite element solution, using, of course, exact integration, I always assumed, I should maybe point that very strongly still out, we assume that we use exact integration of the K-matrix, meaning, in this particular case, we are using two-point integration along the length of the beam, two-point Gauss integration along the length of the beam. With that scheme, then, we obtain, with h over l being 0.5, well, an error, but something still reasonable. After all, we are only using one element. Of course, we are pretty far off, but still something reasonable. But now notice, as you decrease h, h over l, of course, becomes much smaller. Theta analytical goes up. The beam basically bends, is very flexible as it gets thinner. And the finite element solution also becomes more flexible, gives us a more flexible beam, but is much too stiff when compared to the analytical solution. Notice four orders of magnitudes different. If you plot it, this is basically zero compared to that value, and that means the beam locks. It doesn't really at all bend, really, anymore as H becomes very thin. This behavior is, of course, also observed when you take more than one element to model the beam. Here, we show more elements than just one, and notice that each of these elements must still, should still carry a constant bending moment. If it cannot do so, it develops, in other words, these spurious shear strains, we are going to have a very stiff model, even when we use that many elements. Let's look at this particular example closer. And here we have an example beam, in other words, a cantilever beam subjected to the bending moment, L equals 10 meter, square cross section, height 0.1 meter. We use the two noted beam elements to model this cantilever, and we plot the tip deflection as a function of the number of elements, a most interesting graph. Look here is the beam theory solution, and here we plot the number of elements. Here we talk about 400 elements, because there's times 10 to the 2 down here. 400 elements at this point, 600 elements, 800 elements, 200 elements. At this point, we have 100 elements. The height of an element is equal to the length of the element. And at this point, we still don't even get a good value, a good approximation to the beam theory solution. We need basically something like 4 to 500, 600 elements to get close to the beam theory solution. However, if we take a very large number of elements, we actually do converge. But we need a lot of elements, as you can see here. Of course, it is quite impractical to use this kind of two-noted beam element to model thin structures, thin beams. Once again, I must point out that we used two-point Gauss integration into the R direction, and therefore we're dealing with the exact K matrix. The exact K matrix corresponding to the interpolation that we have embedded into the element. In fact, if we look in this regime here, down here, we find that, as shown on this view graph, the solution really uh, becomes better very slowly as the number of elements is increased. Notice that the solution really doesn't increase in accuracy much at all as we go from 10, 20 to 30 elements. Uh, a remedy for the two-node beam element is to only use one-point integration along the beam axis. This then corresponds to assuming a constant transfer shear strain. However, by using one-point integration, we still integrate the bending strains exactly, because remember, beta is linear, del beta del x is constant, and one-point integration will pick up that term exactly. If we look at the results, now, once again, of this problem, 
cantilever problem, subject, the cantilever beam is subjected to an end moment, tip end moment. We find now which H over L, as shown here, Theta analytical shown here, and our finite element solution with just one element, using one element, of course now with one point integration in the R direction, gives us excellent results. In fact, the exact results, as you can see here. The three and four node beam elements evaluated using two and three point integration are similarly effective. In fact, they give us also the exact results, of course, for this problem that we considered. We should note now that these beam elements, based on what one might term reduced integration, are actually reliable elements because they do not possess any spurious zero, zero energy modes. They have, in other words, only six non-zero, uh, sorry, they have only six zero energy modes corresponding to the actual uh, physical rigid body modes that the elements should contain, should be able to represent in a three-dimensional space. So they only have those six zero eigenvalues in a 3D uh, analysis that they should have and no spurious zero energy modes. The formulation can actually be interpreted as a mixed interpolation of displacements and transverse shear strains. And this is really the key for developing also low order effective shell elements. I will get back to that in just a little while. So far we have talked about shear locking. I mentioned earlier also that there, that there is a phenomenon of membrane locking. Membrane locking means that in addition to not exhibiting erroneous shear strains, the beam model must also not contain erroneous mid-surface membrane strains, and particularly when we analyze curved structures. Uh, the beam elements that I just mentioned, two noted beam with one point R integration, three noted beam with two point R integration, four noded beam with three point R integration do also not membrane lock. Let's consider here once again a simple example. A simple curved beam subjected to a bending moment, tip bending moment, fixed at the other end. Here is an angle alpha uh, that the beam spans out. The exactly integrated three noded beam element when curved, does contain erroneous shear strains and erroneous mid-surface membrane strains. In other words, shear locks and membrane locks. And that is shown in this table here, uh, at least to some extent. What I can't show is how much there is shear locking and how much there is membrane locking. You would see that both effects are very significant. If you were to run, for example, this beam element at a computer, with a computer program, using uh, for this beam element three-point integration into the R direction and printing out the stresses. Print out all the stress components and look at the shear components and the membrane components, in other words, the normal stress components along the neutral axis. If you do so, you would see that there are very significant shear stresses and very significant membrane stresses, which of course should be zero for this problem. And these are, of course, causing the locking effect. Here we have the results in terms of just uh, rotations, h over r now, with r equal to 100 given here, analytical value given here, fine element solution, three node element with three point integration. You can see we have a locking phenomena right here. Once again, how much there is membrane and how much shear locking you would see by actually running the problem and looking at the shear stress and the membrane stress. And uh, the fine element solution with two-point integration gives excellent results. Excellent results. So this is, of course, the element that we would be using in engineering practice. Similarly, we can study the use of the four-node cubic beam element. And here we find that uh, for h over r, these values, analytical value once more listed here, we find that the four-node element with four-point integration gives also very good results. And the three-point integration gives also excellent results. So we note that the cubic beam element 
performs well even when using full integration. It is not susceptible to membrane and shear locking. But notice we have our, mid, our uh, third point nodes exactly at the third point of the elements. Once we start shifting these nodes, then we would also not get as good results as shown here, as shown here. We would not get these good results once you shift the nodes at the third point away from their physical third point locations. Now, considering the analysis of shells, the phenomena of shear, of shear and membrane locking are also present, but the difficulty lies in that this simple reduced integration approach that we are using for the beam elements cannot be directly applied because the resulting elements contain spurious zero energy modes. For example, the four node shell element, if you integrate the four node shell element just with one point integration, contains six spurious zero energy modes. In other words, it has altogether 12 zero eigenvalues, whereas it should only have six. The six of them are spurious modes. And such spurious energy modes can lead to very large errors in the solution that, unless we have a comparison with accurate results, are not known. And therefore, it can be very dangerous uh, to use such elements. We want to have elements that are reliable in general applications. And these elements should only contain the actual physical rigid body modes, no spurious zero energy modes. And of course, should also have high predictive capability, not have any shear or membrane locking. Uh, for this reason, we can only recommend the 16 node shell element with 4x4 Gauss integration. The cubic element result, cubic beam element result, that I just showed you regarding the analysis of the curved beam, already indicated that the cubic element does quite well. In fact, that is also borne out by the 16 node shell element. Using 4x4 Gauss integration on the shell mid surface, we have an element that is relatively immune to membrane and shear locking, but I mentioned already that the element should not be distorted. And if it's not distorted, it performs best. I'd just like to share now with you some thoughts regarding developments that we have recently pursued. Uh, namely, recently we have developed elements based on the mixed interpolation of tensorial components. This sounds very complicated. Actually, if you look at closely what we are doing, it is not that complicated. The elements, however, do not lock in shear or membrane action and also do not contain any spurious zero energy modes. And of course, that is the key of success of an element. We will use in, uh, later on in the example solutions a four node element that is based on this mixed interpolation of tensorial components. We call that element the MITC4 mixed interpolation tensorial components with four nodes element. And I want to, of course, discuss this element just briefly with you now. We also have developed, developed an element that we call MITC8 element. It's an eight node element based on mixed interpolation of tensorial components, a most interesting development. Uh, if you're interested in that development, please refer to the paper that is given or that is being referred to in the study guide. Uh, I'd like to discuss with you now the MITC4 element and then show you example solutions. However, we have, in order to be able to do that, uh, to change now the real. So let us just do so and then continue with this discussion. So let us look then at the MITC4 element briefly, uh, the element that I mentioned before we had the break. The element carries four nodes, or is described using four nodes. We have the same isoparametric coordinate system that we are usually having. Notice here a director vector, same description as for the shell element that we discussed in the earlier lecture. The each, node, each node has five degrees of freedom two rotational degrees of freedom and three translational degrees of freedom. Once again, the way we have been discussing it in the earlier lecture. We use the element for analysis of plates and for the analysis of moderately thick shells and also thin shells. And that is the important point. This element is directly applicable in a very effective manner to thin shell analysis. 
The key step in the formulation of the element is to interpolate the geometry and the displacements as earlier described, as we discussed in the earlier lecture. But to interpolate the transverse shear strain tensor components separately. And these interpolations are selected judiciously. To tie then the intensities of these components to the values evaluated using the displacement interpolations. Let's look at what I'm saying here now pictorially. The strain tensor interpolation that we are using is shown here in blue on the black element. These are the RT transfer shear strain tensor components. This is one interpolation function and this is the other interpolation function. Notice that if we look at the R and S axis, uh, the RT strain tensor component is constant in R but varies linearly with S. Here too, constant in R varying linearly with S. Now it's these intensities, one here and one there, that we tie to the nodal point displacements and rotations. Here for this intensity we use these nodal points descriptions and for this intensity we use these nodal point descriptions or nodal point degrees of freedom. So if you recognize that these are, it seems, unknown quantities that enter into the formulation since we're using these two interpolations. This one is an unknown quantity that enters into the formulation. That one is an unknown quantity that enters into the formulation. If you recognize that, then you have to ask yourself, what do we do with these unknown quantities? Well, we eliminate these unknown quantities by expressing them in terms of the nodal point degrees of freedom these two nodes here and these two nodes and thus we eliminate these tensor intensity, tensor component intensities and in the K matrix and the F vector we end up having then only the nodal point displacement degrees of freedom and that's the key part. For the ST transfer shear strain tensor components we use these two interpolations. Now we notice that we have a linear description in R and constant in S for both of these two uh, components. We proceed, of course, to eliminate this intensity and that intensity in terms of the nodal point degrees of freedom. Same way as we are proceeding here. This element, the MITC4 element, has only six zero eigenvalues, no spurious zero energy modes. It passes a patch test and this is a very important point, that the element passes the patch test. What do we mean by the patch test? Well, the idea in the patch test is that any arbitrary patch of elements should be able to represent constant stress conditions. Let's see how we perform that patch test. Here we take an arbitrary patch of elements, some of which, some of the elements in that patch of elements would be geometrically distorted and we subje subject this patch to the minimum displacement rotation boundary conditions to eliminate the physical rigid body modes and then constant boundary tractions corresponding to the constant stress condition that is tested. These two items uh, we apply to the element, to the patch of elements and then we calculate all nodal point displacements and element stresses. The patch test is passed if the calculated element internal stresses and nodal point displacements are correct. In other words, let's go through this thought once again. What we're doing really is we are looking at the structure. In essence, we are taking out of this big mesh of elements in the structure a certain set of elements. We call that set of elements a patch of elements we apply to this patch of elements the minimum boundary conditions to eliminate the rigid body modes and tractions along the boundary that should result in constant stress conditions within the elements. If in fact our solution for that patch of elements gives us constant stress conditions and nodal point displacements 
that correspond to these constant stress conditions, then the patch test is passed. And this means that we would have an element that ultimately, as the mesh is made finer and finer, with that element will converge, or the solution will converge to the correct uh, solution. That's the patch test, a most important test, particularly for shell elements, when we have these complications of uh, various kinds of interpolations in the, in the element formulation and so on. Well, here schematically, I show such patch of elements. X1 axis, X2 axis, flat patch of elements. Notice the elements are distorted, not rectangular elements. We take certain material properties, assign a certain thickness. We make it a thin patch of elements. These are the uh, plate that we're looking at here is in essence thin. Notice thickness 0.01, width 10 in both directions. And so if the elements would lock due to shear or membrane locking the way we discussed it earlier, we would certainly see it by subjecting this patch of elements to bending moment boundary conditions. The membrane tests would correspond to these stress conditions. The bending twisting tests would correspond to these stress conditions. These are the externally applied forces, tractions that the patch of elements is subjected for bending twisting tests, here for membrane tests. And once again, we take out the, uh, just the rigid body modes by, uh, from the patch of elements by setting the appropriate number of degrees of freedom, nodal point degrees of freedom, equal to zero, and then subject that patch of elements to the tractions corresponding to these stress conditions, the six ones that I'm showing here, and we measure the internal stresses and find whether these internal stresses indeed correspond to the constant stress situation. Also, since only those nodal point degrees of freedom have been removed uh, on the boundary that take out the rigid body modes, we should also see that the other nodal point degrees of freedom, of course, have taken on the exact analytical value corresponding to the constant stress condition that is tested. This one, that one, that one, or the other three here. That's the patch test. Well, let us now look at some examples uh, regarding the elements that we have discussed in the previous lecture and this lecture. And the first example that I'd like to look at with you is the analysis of a spherical shell with a hole. There's a hole here, and you see the sphere here. Here's the backside of the sphere shown by a dashed line. And this sphere is subjected to concentrated forces shown by these arrows. Radius given here, thickness given here, and the material property of the sphere, sphere given right there. Uh, the first step is to select director vectors. We talked in the previous lecture about very heavily about the fact that we use director vectors and we have to define these director vectors, the initial director vectors or the director vectors for the initial configuration. And we, in fact, in this particular case, can quite easily generate the director vectors for each node. The director vector for each node in this particular case is chosen to be parallel to the radial vector. So if we look, this is the skin of the shell from the uh, midpoint out to via the radial vector, we would see the director vector right there in two dimensions, of course, x and y. Uh, so we generate these director vectors in Adena that it can be done automatically. And uh, then we would select the boundary, displacement boundary conditions. If we look at what happens, for example, in the zx phase, uh, using symmetry conditions, of course, we would only look at a particular part of the shell. The part of the shell, in fact, maybe I should show you that one first here, that we want to look at is right shown here. Notice here we have the part of the shell that we analyze because of symmetry conditions. We have here a symmetry boundary and there a symmetry boundary. Notice that we have x, y, and z 
the coordinate system used here, and that this part of the shell really lies in the uh, part of the coordinate system that we're looking at. In other words, zy, y here, z up there, x, z, x here, z comes out there. So here we have y equal to 0 on this face, and on this face here we have x equal to 0. And what I like to now talk briefly about is about the selection of the boundary conditions along these two faces. Uh, well, these boundary conditions, if we look at the zx phase, in other words, this phase here, we see on this view graph here, the x phase, here is the shell. Here we would have our director vector at time 0 and at time t. That director vector would have moved as indicated by the red here. Uh, notice that with this movement, of course, the only rotation that we can have is the theater y rotation. And that is now shown on the next view graph. Notice theater y here is free, a free rotation. Theater x must be 0. Theater z must be 0. And of course, uy must be 0 because this is, these are material particles. In particular, that one there is a material particle on the zx phase. So uy is 0. uz and ux are free. The three degrees of freedom, once again, uz, ux, and theta y. Uh, well, to uh, impose then the uh, boundary condition, we would proceed, as shown for this material particle, along all the nodes on this phase, and similarly, of course, on the other phase, the phase on zy. To prevent the rigid body translations, we would also have to take one degree of freedom out, namely one z degree of freedom out, one displacement degree of freedom corresponding to the z direction out. And that then would basically give us all the boundary conditions that we have to apply for this problem. So let's look at this view graph here to show the mesh that we are using. And we show here that at this node, we set uz equal to 0 to prevent the rigid body motion into this direction. The linear elastic analysis results for this problem uh, are given here. Notice displacement at the point of load application is 0.0936. The analytical value is shown here. Pictorially, the original mesh is shown in black and the deformed mesh is shown in red. The important point of this problem, and I'd like to go back to it once more, is really that when we look at this mesh, that we define the director vectors at each of these nodes, and that can be done automatically, they can be generated, that at each of these internal nodes we use five degrees of freedom, we have two locally aligned alpha and beta degrees of freedom, the ones that I talked about in the earlier lecture, at each of these internal nodes. I like to distinguish the internal nodes here from the boundary nodes. On the boundary nodes, we, of course, have also only five natural degrees of freedom, but we assign now six degrees of freedom there, meaning that the alpha and beta degrees of freedom are rotated into the three Cartesian coordinate axes so as to have three rotations at each of these nodes on the symmetry faces, and then we can very easily impose the symmetry boundary conditions that I just talked about. That's the important point of this problem, really. How we model the boundary conditions and what degrees of freedom are assigned to each of the nodes. Well, as a second example, I like to consider with you the analysis of an open box, a five-sided open box. Here we show the box upside down, 
uh, or open side down. The open side, in other words, is down here. And the box lies on a rigid, frictionless surface. On top here, we have pressure applied to the face. The box is modeled using shell elements. The point of this problem is to show you, to discuss with you, how we are modeling this box using the concept of director vectors, five degrees of freedom, six degrees of freedom, that we discussed in the earlier lecture. So what we need to do here is choose initial director vectors, choose, fi choose five or six degrees of freedom for each node, and choose the appropriate boundary conditions. Uh, the way we proceed there is as follows. We recognize that we could deal with director vectors at every one of the nodes, but if we do so at a corner, you would have no unique director vector. You could, of course, assign there a mean normal. In other words, if, if you look closely here, my hands show the corner and the pointer shows the mean normal uh, at that corner. And that mean normal, mean in quotes, would be the direction of the director vector. Let me show it from up like that. Here you have the right angle between my hands and you have the pointer giving you the director vector. That would be one possibility. However, if you use Adina, then in this particular case, it is more effective to not input director vectors because if you don't do so with Adina, then for each node, Adina will generate automatically a mid-surface normal vector. In other words, if no director vector is input for a node, then Adina generates for each element connected to the node a nodal point mid-surface normal vector at that node from the element geometry. Now what does this mean? It means that if you use this option, there will then be as many different nodal point mid-surface normal vectors at the node as there are elements connected to the node. Now we have to look at this statement much more closely for this particular example. In this particular case, using the option of automatic generation of element nodal point mid-surface normal vectors, we find that at a node away from an edge, we will end up with just one mid-surface normal vector. Because, see, this is a flat surface, and the program will calculate for this element, and that element, and that element, and this element, corresponding to that node, the same normal vector. And that is the normal vector that the program will then use. However, if we look at an edge, along an edge, and pick a node there, then at this node there will be one normal vector calculated for this element and that element at that node, shown by this red arrow, and one normal vector at this node calculated for this element and that element, shown by this red arrow. Of course, here you would have three normal vectors, one on that face, that face, and this face. Well, with these normal vectors then given, uh, you recognize that there will be no stiffness about the rotation or corresponding to the rotation about this vector because these elements don't carry stiffness in this rotational degree of freedom. We have to be uh, careful with that. And we have got to make sure that uh, we solve the problem with this rotation, the rotation corresponding to this vector here, or about this vector, being deleted in the model. Whereas at this node here, we assign six degrees of freedom to the model because the rotation corresponding to this, uh, around this vector, will have stiffness, around this vector will have stiffness, and if you think of a rotation uh, in the direction of that vector, but at this node, about this direction, you will have also stiffness. So we need six degrees of freedom being assigned at a node that corresponds to an edge or corner, whereas five degrees of freedom to, uh, to be assigned to all other nodes. This is once more summarized here. Five degrees of freedom at all the nodes inside 
of end phase, six degrees of freedom along an edge, and of course also at a corner. Let us look now overall at the boundary conditions that we have to assign to the box in order to be able to solve the problem. Here we show now the box open side up. So this is really the side on which the box is placed, but we just switch the box around so that we can more easily look at what happens on this boundary here. Well, we have nodes that are, we might call nodes, internal nodes, along here, nodes that are not corner nodes, and these nodes would have the following boundary condition. First of all, all the rotational degrees of freedom shown by this arrow, this double arrow, must have been deleted. This I just discussed. It is due to the fact that there is no stiffness corresponding to this rotation at that node, because all the elements coming into that node don't have stiffness corresponding to this rotational degree of freedom. This degree of freedom is free. That one is free. This rotation is free. That rotation is free. This translation is also deleted. That is due to the fact that the box can't move vertically. It's placed on the rigid surface. Uh, if we look at a node that is a corner node, and let's pick a more typical one, here we have one, then at this node we only take out, as you can see, the z displacement degree of freedom. Because, once again, the box lies on a rigid flat surface. But notice that these rotations, all three rotations, are left free. They all carry stiffness the way I already discussed it. Also, these translations are free. Typical corner node, another typical corner node, same action as at this corner node. Now, here we see something in addition. We see that this degree of freedom is taken out, same way as over there. But we also see that this degree of freedom is taken out. This one is taken out in order to prevent a rigid body rotation about my pointer here. A rigid body rotation about the pointer. That's why we take this one out. And we take this one out and that one out to also prevent the rigid body rotation that I just mentioned and to prevent the rigid body translation. See, this translation has to be taken out as well and that translation has to be taken out and this rotation has to be taken out. I repeat, this translation, that translation and that rotation, all of those have to be taken out and that is achieved by knocking out this degree of freedom, that one and that one. So these are the boundary conditions that we apply to the nodes on the uh, edges that are lying on the rigid surface. If we perform now a linear elastic static analysis of the box with the uniform pressure applied to the top of the box uh, using our four node MITC4 uh, element, here's a typical element shown. This is the match set that we used. Uh, we find that the deformations are magnified, quite highly magnified, looking like that. Very reasonable uh, deformations. We could not compare here with any other solution, uh, but it's still a very interesting demonstrative example because of the way we are dealing with the director vectors, which actually we don't define. We let the program generate mid-surface nodal point vectors, and because we could discuss the use of the shell element degrees of freedom, freedoms, the uh, imposition of boundary conditions, and other aspects. This then brings me to the end of what I wanted to discuss with you related to uh, view graphs, and I'd like to now share some further experiences with you uh, that are documented on the slides. So let me walk over here and uh, let us discuss the information that is given on the slides. The first slide here uh, relates to the analysis of a simply supported plate under uniform pressure. Uh, this plate is modeled as shown here. We only model one quarter of the plate because of symmetry conditions. And as you can see here, n is equal to 2 for 4 elements. Uh, we analyze this plate and we calculate 
the center displacement, which means the displacement at that point, and compare that center displacement to the analytical solution. Notice that in this particular case, L over H is equal to 1,000. So it's a very thin plate, a very thin plate, and certainly we would get very bad results if we had a shear locking phenomenon in the elements that we're using. As I pointed out earlier, the MIT C4 element does not have any shear locking. And as you can see now here, as we increase n, as shown on this axis, we get excellent convergence behavior to the analytical solution. Now the next slide shows the analysis of a very similar plate, again a square plate, L over H still being a thousand, a uh, simply supported plate, but now the plate is uh, subjected to a concentrated load. And in this particular case, we see the solution results obtained with the MIT C4 element as a function of n, same number n that I referred to in the earlier, view, in the earlier slide. Uh, we see that we get also very good convergence behavior in this particular case. Not quite as good as for the uniformly distributed pressure case, uh, but still very good as well here. The next slide now shows uh, the plate now clamped at its edges, not anymore simply supported. L over H still 1000, so still a very thin plate. And here we once again calculate the center displacement as a function of n, the number of elements used. Remember n equal 2 means 4 elements. Remember n equals 4 means 16 elements. Uh, once again, we see excellent convergence behavior to the exact analytical solution. Uh, and finally, this was a case for uniform pressure. Now we look at the case for a concentrated load applied at the center. And here we see this convergence behavior. Of course, this is a quite a complicated, difficult problem to analyze because of the concentrated load and the clamped boundary conditions. Uh, here in this analysis, we used nice square elements. Uh, a very important consideration in a practical analysis is to identify how well an element performs when it becomes distorted. And the next slides now relate to this, or the next slide relates to that question. Here we now model one quarter of the plate using mesh one, shown here, and using mesh two, shown here. Notice the elements that we are now using in these analyses are still the or is still the MIT C4 element. Each of these elements is an MIT C4 element, but it's a distorted element. And our objective is really to identify what displacement predictions we obtain at the center, at point C of the plate, when the plate is subjected to uniform pressure, and the plate is also simply supported, and what displacements predictions do we obtain for these two meshes at these two points, how much de do they deteriorate when compared to the usage of nice square elements? Well, the displacement predictions are given here, finite element over Kirchhoff theory results, mesh 1, 0.93, mesh 2, 1.01. .01. Notice mesh 2 has just 1% error, mesh 1 has 7% error. But with this mesh 1, we have a very coarse mesh and highly distorted elements. It's of course also of interest to see what moment predictions one's, one obtains. And here we compare the final element moment versus the Kirchhoff moment at point C. And you can see 15% error for mesh 1, 2% error for mesh 2. Actually also very good results for moment prediction as well. I should also emphasize, please, that L over H is equal to 1,000. So we are still talking about this very thin plate. The next slide now shows how the element behaves in the analysis of a skew plate. It's also now a distorted element mesh, or rather the elements used in the meshing of this plate are distorted elements, but they are a little bit more regular distorted. In fact, they are parallelogram elements. Notice, please, that this is a top view, a top view, so we are seeing a plan view of the plate. And
Pick up, lecture 20, tape B, slide 20-7, time code 203318, take one. The next analysis that I like to consider now is the analysis of a skew plate. Here we show a top view of the skew plate with an angle of skew of 30 degrees. So it's a highly skewed plate. And this is a kind of mesh we want to use. Here we show the four by, a 4x4 four four mesh of MITC4 elements. Notice the elements are distorted, but sort of regularly distorted because they are having a parallelogram shape. Uh, the boundary conditions on the plate are simply supported boundary conditions, which I should point out are modeled using the isoparametric degenerate uh, plate elements, shell elements that we talked about. These boundary conditions are modeled by simply setting only the transverse displacement at the nodes on the boundary equal to zero. In other words, the displacements corresponding to the z-axis pointing out of the slide are set equal to zero, but the rotations on the boundary nodes are left free. This is a very interesting point, most interesting point, and if you are like, if you like to read up on it, please refer to the reference that is given in the study guide related to this uh, slide. Well, we use these kinds of meshes to analyze the plate. Notice the material data are given here. The thickness of the plate is given here. B is equal to 1, so we have a thickness to width ratio of 1 hundredths. It's a fairly thin plate, and we are considering uniform uh, pressure applied to the plate. The next slide now shows analysis results. 4x4 four four mesh, 8x8, 16x16, 32x32 meshes were used. We compare our finite element solution at the point C, the midpoint of the plate, uh, versus the Morley solution at that point, and you can see that we really ob have obtained very nice convergence to the Morley solution. Uh, notice here we are looking at the principal moments, actually the maximum and the minimum moments, at that midpoint of the plate again, point C, and we are comparing fine element solutions with Morley solutions, and here once again quite good convergence for the moments as well. Now, in this analysis, we uh, use the kind of mesh, this 4x4 four four mesh that we had on the previous uh, slide, and one can ask, of course, is that a good mesh to use? Well, we deliberately wanted to use this mesh in this analysis to test the capability of the element. Of course, one could use a different mesh, and on the next slide now, I am showing the results obtained by using just four elements, a 2x2 two two mesh, to model one quarter of the plate, and you can see with this 2x2 two two mesh, we get already excellent predictions of the displacement at the point C. This is where point C is once again. Excellent prediction of the displacement at point C when compared with Morley's solution. The moment is, very, is quite poorly predicted still. The two moments that I uh, defined earlier. If we go to a finer mesh, 4x4 four four mesh, the moments, of course, are much better. And so is the displacement prediction. But the displacement prediction was already good, so there is not that much of an, of an improvement. But in general, one can say this here, certainly for displacement prediction, is a much better, better mesh to use than the earlier meshes that we used in the earlier table, or for the earlier table results. Now I'd like to look at another problem, the analysis of a cantilever subjected to an end bending moment and undergoing very large displacements. Uh, here are the data given corresponding to the cantilever, an elastic structure that we're looking at, and we will be measuring V, phi, and U, and U, V, and phi will take on large values. In fact, we will actually normalize U and V to the length of the cantilever. The next slide now shows the results obtained. V over L, U over L, and phi over 2 pi as a function of the moment applied. We're using here a moment parameter, but of course the moment increases along this axis, and here we are plotting U over L, V over L, and phi over 2 pi. Notice that 
even for very large displacements, V over L being 0.7, we get with one cubic element, cubic in the direction of the cantilever, excellent results. Excellent results. This is, in other words, the use of the cubic element, in general the 16-node shell element, uh, for these types of analyses. And it shows that the 16-node shell element is really quite effective. Uh, the next slide now shows how we would apply the MITC4 element. Here we use just two elements to model the cantilever. Bending moment applied here, uh, clamped boundary conditions here, and you can see that here we are plotting u over l, w over l, phi over 2 pi as before, moment parameter along here, and you can see that we are getting really excellent results just with two elements for w over l, 0.6, or certainly up to 0.5, very close to the analytical solution. The analytical solution is given by the solid line. The next slide now shows the results obtained using three MITC4 elements to model the same cantilever. Notice these are now the nodes that we also have used when using the cubic element in our first results. And notice excellent comparison with the analytical solution for u over l w over l and phi over 2 pi, very large displacements, under very large displacement conditions. The next slide now shows the analysis of a eye section clamped at this end and subjected to a torque at this end. This is actually a quite a complicated problem if you think deeper about the problem and recognize that you have torsional condition, restraint warping here, saint venin torsion here, then of course you have bending in the cantilever, in the beam, etc., etc. It's not a very easy problem uh, if you look deeply into the problem, and we wanted to obtain some relatively good prediction for the structural response when the structure undergoes or goes into the elastoplastic regime. Here we have the material data used in the analysis. You can see perfectly plastic conditions by See, uh, by using a uh, tangent material modulus of equal to zero. The slide here now shows one model that we used, namely the use of uh, nine, altogether nine, isoparametric cubic elements. These are rectangular elements. Notice this is one isoparametric element. This is the mid-surface or the neutral axis of that one isoparametric cubic rectangular section element. We are modeling the whole I-beam by assembling the I-beam using nine such elements. Of course, we discussed earlier that these elements contain the proper warping conditions. Uh, we have supplemented our isoparametric interpolations by warping functions, and those now, of course, will be activated in picking up the torsional response or modeling the torsional response. This is a free end, that's a fixed end. This was one model that we used, and in addition we used another model, which is shown here, a model of shell elements, nine node shell elements, nine such elements. Uh, of course, a better response would have been obtained by using the 16 node element, but that of course would have been a more expensive analysis. So in this particular case, we uh, wanted to test this model versus the isoparametric beam model that I just showed you. Notice one interesting point, how we are modeling uh, this connection here. You see a blown up uh, figure of it. At this point, or at this node C, we have just five degrees of freedom. No rotational stiffness about this vector here. So that is not a degree of freedom. Here we have six degrees of freedom, three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom. Here we have five degrees of freedom. No degree of freedom, no stiffness corresponding to the rotation about this vector here. That's one of the important points that we discussed earlier already. Well, to proceed with the analysis, we actually use the longitudinal element dimensions shown here. Notice that we use a shorter element at the fixed end then here it's a free end, because we anticipate heavy plasticity here that we wanted to model quite accurately. Uh, once again, the torque is applied here, and theta x is measured here. 
And on the next slide now, we show the variation of the torque as a function of the uh, theta x rate uh, rotation. Notice here you have the ISO B model solution, and here you have the shell model solution. We compare our results with a sand heap solution and a merchant's upper bound solution. These are simplified analytical solutions to this problem. Uh, our results here are somewhat close, but not very close. Of course, one could now make a much deeper study of this problem, a very interesting problem, but the way we now already have concluded our study and the way I show you the results here, I think it's already quite valuable because we have learned a bit regarding the modeling of this type of problem. Uh, well, the next slide now shows a final problem for which I wanted to show you some solution results. Here we have a shell, a cylindrical shell, supported on rigid diaphragms at the ends and the shell is subjected to uniform pressure. We measure here WB, the displacement at that particular point B. The data corresponding to the shell are given here. Notice that we model the shell as an elastic, perfectly plastic material. And notice that in the shell we modeled only this part of the shell, this quarter part of the shell, using a 9 by 9 uniform mesh of the 4-node MITC4 element. Uh, the results are now given on the uh, slide shown here. Pressure applied plotted along this axis, WB plotted along this axis, and this is the nonlinear solution response we have obtained using the MITC4 element, and we compare our solution with the solution given by Krakeland. I might point out that in this analysis we used our automatic load stepping scheme that we discussed when we talked about the solution of the nonlinear finite element equations in an earlier lecture. A uh, very good comparison up to this point with Krakeland solution. We did not go much further than that solution given because we could not compare with any other solution anyway. Uh, well, this brings me now to the end of what I wanted to discuss with you regarding shell elements. Of course, please remember there is a lot more information that we could have discussed but, and that we could have studied together, but uh, we only have two lectures and this is the information that I wanted to share with you in these two lectures. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please also refer to the papers that are given as references for these two lectures, particularly for the slides where you will find much more information, many, many more details regarding this material that we discussed. Thank you very much for your attention.